In the previous video clip, we noted that invasive species were one of the primary reasons for the loss of biodiversity worldwide. Because they are so important, I wanted to take a few more minutes to discuss how invasive species impact ecosystems. First, let's review the de definition of what an invasive species is. It's a non-native species whose introduction causes economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. So it's not simply a species that's not native to an area. Rather, it has to be a non-native species who's causing harm. Harm caused by invasive species can be at the ecosystem level or at the community or population level. Let's look first at ecosystem level impacts. The examples are going to, I'm going to give are for an invasive plant species, but you can imagine also how invasive animals might impact a local ecosystem. So first, an invasive plant might alter the fire regime of the area. Perhaps it has a lot of woody debris or oily debris that catches fire easily. Or perhaps it alters the hydrology of the area because it takes a great deal of water from certain parts of that ecosystem. Or perhaps it alters erosion or the sedimentation process. Or even the soil chemistry. Invasives can also have impacts at the population or community level. They definitely alter the community composition, as now, now they are a new player in the community. They compete with native populations for resources, and in some cases may even reduce or eliminate native populations. Additionally, they can create conditions for non-native invasive animals or plants. For example, English ivy creates conditions that are great for snails and rats. And notably, by bringing in other non-native species, it may reduce the recruitment of native species. It may completely alter ecological succession. And lastly, the invasive species may hybridize with native species. Next, let's look at some specific examples. Red brome has completely transformed many of the southwestern desert areas that it has invaded. It spreads out over the desert landscape, unlike the native species. Further, it fuels fires where previous native vegetation did not. So the native species there are not adapted to fire conditions and cannot survive the frequent and widespread burns. Next, check out the giant salvinia and water hyacinth. Both of these plants are native to South America, and they're aquatic, floating aquatic plants. Both of these two pictures show ponds or lakes, not prairies, but the salvinia and hyacinth have completely covered the pond or lake. In both cases, these plants clearly alter the light regime in that they shade out formerly native species that would have existed in the water column or down below on the bottom of the pond or lake. Additionally, they affect the dissolved oxygen levels in the water body. First, there's probably very few bottom-dwelling plants that are adding oxygen to the water. And second, importantly, when this dense vegetative matter decomposes, aerobic bacteria in the water column and in the sediment below decompose the material and use up oxygen present in the water column, thus depleting the water body of oxygen. So not only are native plants eliminated due to lack of light, but also native fish and other aquatic organisms may be eliminated due to depleted oxygen levels. Next, consider this native bunch grass versus a knapweed that's invaded the Pacific Northwest. Compare the roots of the native wheat grass. It's fibrous, soil-holding properties of the roots compared to the very wispy root 
of the knapgrass that's unable to help hold the soil together. However, the knapweed, with its longer root, is able in some situations to outcompete the bunch grass for water. Interestingly, other invasive plants may hold soils better than the native species that they displace, in some cases leading to significant changes in geomorphology and topography. European beach grass was planted to stabilize dunes along the Pacific coastline. It has actually been too effective in invading huge areas of dunes up and down the coast where it forms dense stands that trap much more sand than the native beach grasses did. And this has actually led to a difference in the shape, height, and orientation of the dunes. Pacific Coast dunes formed under the native vegetation were generally oriented perpendicular to the beach, and dunes formed with European beach grass are oriented parallel to the beach, often forming long ridges, and this, alter, this alters the hydrology of the, of the swales, and it also impacts the ability for some small organisms to migrate to and from the ocean. Each semester I ask students to research a particular California invasive species. It can be an animal or a plant. Some semesters this is a homework assignment and some semesters it's an exam question. In both cases you'll need to be able to name the species, the common name is fine, and answer the following questions. Where did the species come from? Where is it native to? Second, how did it get to California? If it was brought here intentionally, be sure to say why. Third, what ecological and or economic harm does it cause? And you should identify at least two harmful impacts. And then lastly, what is being done? Again, this will either be an exam question or an assignment question. Either way, I encourage you to to do some research now and get it out of the way. Here's some good sources. The first is California Department of Fish and Game. They have some excellent fact sheets on several uh, invasive animals. And the second source there is the Invasive Plant Council of California. And they have a huge list of invasive plants. Some of them they have a lot of information for, some of them they have less information, and you would probably need to do a little further research. Alrighty, anyway, uh, get this done so that you're prepared for that assignment or the exam.